Okay, um, last talk of the day uh, before um, our president's wrapping up session. Uh, Zoltan Sylvester is a research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology, Economic Geology uh, out at uh, University of Texas at Austin. He's the co-principal investigator of the Quantitative Clastics Laboratory, and his research focuses on the geomorphology and stratigraphy of clastic depositional systems. He has a PhD from Stanford and has previously worked in research labs in the energy industry. So uh, with that, I hand over to Zoltan. Thanks. Um, thank you, and uh, uh, thanks a lot for, for uh, having me here. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about uh, uh, meandering, both in, in fluvial and uh, submarine channels. And there will be many connections in this talk, I think, with both uh, what Bjorn was presenting and then Elizabeth. Um, and this is basically a, a just giving you a flavor of the range of things that we do with meandering systems uh, at the Quantitative Plastics Laboratory. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, my collaborators, J. Cole, Paul Durkin, Steve Hubbard, David Morick, Indra Altman, Paul Morris, and Paul Speed. And uh, the way I want to go through this is basically uh, discuss three main uh, very broad points. The first one is plan view migration in meandering systems. And within that, I want to talk a bit more about point bars and counterpoint bars uh, and how they influence heterogeneity. Uh, the second is uh, incision in meandering systems. And the third one is aggradation and how these two uh, impact the stratigraphy. Uh, and along the way, I'm gonna touch a little bit on uh, some other big subjects like fluvial versus submarine meandering, similarities and differences, stratigraphic preservation, uh, and the use of simple models, which I'm uh, very fond of. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, uh, and, and Bjorn did an excellent job uh, emphasizing uh, this amazing resource that we have uh, as sedimentary uh, geoscientists, uh, which is uh, having access for free to, to uh, a large amount of satellite imagery and uh, elevation data. And we should take advantage of that. Uh, so let me go back in time to probably the first paper that uh, uh, estimated measured migration rates in meandering rivers uh, carefully. And this is a paper by Hickin and Nansen who went out uh, to the Beaton River in British Columbia and uh, used dend dendrochronology. There was no Landsat uh, really at that time, uh, not for this purpose anyway. Uh, and they, so they, they estimated migration rates uh, in 10 bends of this river. And they came up with this plot uh, where uh, they put a radius of channel cur curvature normalized by channel width on the, on the X axis if you can see my cursor and uh, migration rate in meters per year on the y-axis. And what they found is this distribution of points. So they said it looks like uh, in small, relatively sharp bends, the migration rate is low and then it goes to a maximum somewhere over here. And then in large bands, which have large radiuses of curvature, it declines again. So it's a complex nonlinear relationship. And they found some good theoretical reasons why they thought that this was, this was an important result. And again, this is a highly influential paper uh, with lots of good data, lots of pioneering concepts. Uh, and this plot has become a, a really popular one in fluvial geomorphology. The problem is that through the years, uh, as more data points were added and gathered from different rivers, uh, and I'm only showing one data set uh, here from the Dane River, uh, the plot has become a lot noisier to say the least. Uh, so the question arises, can we actually say anything about migration rate based on curvature, based on radius of curvature or curvature? And I think if we look at these kinds of plots, uh, all we can say is that uh, above three or four uh, on this kind of plots, uh, Migration rate tends to be low overall, but anything goes below that. So uh, long story short, the predictive power of these kinds of plots, I think, is limited. And the question arises, can we do uh, something different, maybe? Is, is, is this really how, how well we can predict something as basic as how 
uh, meanders move. And what I will try to do now uh, is, is use a few animations to, uh, uh, to illustrate uh, the simplicity of the connection between, uh, between migration rate and curvature. Um, let me try to lay this. Um, so the first thing we have to remember is that uh, curvature is the inverse of the radius of curvature. And sometimes these are used in the wrong way. And, but, but we can plot the points of maximum curvature for each, uh, each band on this uh, uh, imaginary channel. And those are the y dots. And then we can plot the inflection points, which are points of zero curvature. Those are the red dots. And then we can think about what is the simplest possible model of meandering. And we need to consider that the centrifugal force is a linear function of curvature. So if this force drives meandering, then we could simply say that migration rate is simply a function, a linear function of curvature. So we use channel width and the migration constant to transform curvature into, uh, into a migration uh, rate uh, uh, vector. And if you plot these vectors along the channel, like uh, you can see it happening now on the screen, hopefully, uh, we can predict the next location of the, of the channel. Uh, and we kind of have a simple model of meandering. I think it looks, looks pretty good. Um, we have curvature or nominal migration rate, if you want, on the y-axis and the long channel distance. Uh, and we can see how both curvature and migration rate vary in a periodic manner along these lines. It looks quite not too bad, I would say. So does this actually work? Well, it doesn't. Um, if I can step to the next animation, uh, we can go through a simple uh, thought experiment, which was published by uh, David John Furbish a while ago. And what we are looking at is two bands with the same radius of curvature. Uh, you can see that the circles are exactly the same. Uh, and these, so these bands have constant uh, curvatures and constant radiuses of curvature. I want to mention right now that this is totally unrealistic. Uh, no meander band outside in nature looks like this uh, because curvature is not constant. I, I kind of already hinted at that before. But for the sake of running this exercise, uh, uh, let's use, uh, okay, um, my animations are not always working as I hope they do. So we are back at these circles. Uh, and so let's use the, the, the first model that I talked about, where migration is simply a function of local curvature, right? And plot these migration vectors. Uh, and that's how they look like. And if we stop for a second on this uh, and look at it, it just doesn't look right. The nature doesn't like uh, discrete jumps like you have here in curvature in the first place. But also if you imagine these uh, meanders migrating through time, uh, they will quickly blow up essentially and, and look very unnatural. So this, this is not right. Uh, uh, so let's move on and look at uh, the other model, which is actually physics-based, where migration is the weighted sum of upstream curvatures. It's still very simple, uh, but we take into account uh, the curvatures that are upstream from any given point. Right, uh, and I didn't mean to, to jump back to that, but uh, uh, if now we, we go back uh, to, the, uh, to the original channel that we looked at and use this uh, weighted sum of upstream curvature uh, model, then we get something like, like this, uh, where the white line shows the, the location of the new channel uh, using uh, this model, which is essentially the same as Howard and Knudsen uh, published in 1984. And uh, if we do this, now we have uh, points of zero migration shown in black here, right? Where there's no migration. And these points are distinct from the inflection points and they lie downstream from those. So 
if uh, we flatten this, uh, these curves again, then we can see that uh, uh, the migration rate curve, which is the white one, is shifted downstream relative to the curvature uh, curve, which is the red one. Uh, and sorry about that. Um, so if, if uh, we zoom in, we see that uh, between the two curves, there is a lag. Uh, and this lag tends to be roughly the same along the channel. Uh, and also the other observation we can make is that uh, the curvature vectors are, have the opposite orientation from the, from the migration vectors uh, within this short interval. So that's, that's really saying that the, the meander, the, the river is migrating here in the wrong direction if you want, uh, not what you would expect in a point bar. So these are locations of counterpoint bars, and I will get back to that. But before I do that, I want to point out another aspect of this, which is uh, if we zoom out, uh, there are the lags. Uh, and then if we shift the migration rate uh, and then plot the migration rate against the curvature after taking into account this lag, then we get a nice quasi-linear relationship if this model is correct. And so, so the obvious question is, uh, does this work in nature? And uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but we uh, looked at seven rivers in the Amazon basin, uh, uh, and we found that the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, these are just two scatter plots between, again, this is the same as curvature, essentially, and we have migration rate on the y-axis. And especially with rivers that migrate uh, relatively slowly, like this one, the relationship is really good. I mean, R squared is, uh, is larger than 0.7. Uh, so it, this really simple model uh, works uh, surprisingly well, I would say. So can we predict migration? Uh, and I think I, we haven't spent a lot of time on this so far, uh, although I, I think it's very interesting, but we definitely can post dict if you want migration. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential also in, uh, using machine learning to use some of these concepts uh, uh, on, on rivers. So let's talk about counterpoint bars for a second, uh, maybe more than a second. Uh, so here's an example from uh, uh, Canada that uh, Daryl Smith and others looked at in, in more detail. And uh, they have taken some cores, and if you look at the, the point bar, uh, core 1A comes from there, and it shows a nice upward finding uh, uh, typical point bar succession that you would expect. However, if we move downstream, uh, what we call the counterpoint bar, there's a lot of silt and mud, a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, and that has been known. These counterpoint bars have been described for a while. Uh, they have been linked to downstream uh, to, to confinement, which is not really obvious in this case. Uh, but they haven't really been quantified. Like, how do you tell uh, exactly uh, where a counterpoint bar is. It's not that, not that easy if you just look at the map. And the answer is, I already gave the answer. Uh, the answer is counterpoint bars develop where the curvature vector is pointing the opposite direction from the migration vector, right? Here, the bank is depositional despite the fact that it's concave. So the, these things are also called uh, uh, concave deposition. Uh, uh, concave bank deposition, right? So we can use that to try to quantify the point bar to counter point bar spectrum. And here's an example from the Kaikuk River where we have a strong uh, uh, resistant uh, bank on this side. And you can see the typical uh, conventional counter point bar where this bend is forced to migrate downstream like a lot. Uh, however, there are also other spots here which are unrelated to any uh, erosion res resistant banks. And those are the ones that we are really interested in. And in order to explore these, these concepts in, in more detail, we introduced this idea of a bar type index where you simply combine curvature with migration rate by taking the product of the two, and that's the red line. So when the red line, uh, the bar type index goes negative, that's where you have counterpoint bars. So the, the brown spots on this channel are the locations where you expect the development of counterpoint bars and everything that goes with them. Again, this is a fundamental part of meandering. You cannot, cannot make meandering work without 
places on the channel that have this uh, uh, kind of relationship between migration and curvature. Um, so why do some meanders translate more downstream than others? Well, if we think about where the point of maximum curvature is and the fact that there is a lag between that and the point of maximum migration, which is the red dots, uh, on large meander bands, it doesn't really matter that there is this lag because they would still be expanding. This is point of maximum migration. These bands will just keep growing the same with this. However, this small guy here will show a lot of translation because this lag is relatively large compared to the size of the band. So often these small bands in rivers are related to perturbations like cutoffs, as we will see in a second. Uh, so we went back to the Mamore River uh, in Bolivia and did a lot of mapping uh, with uh, Paul Durkin and others uh, to, to look at basically map counterpoint bars and point bars. And that's what you see here. Uh, and we can look at animations, specific details. So what you see here is a, is a cutoff that is using, uh, taking advantage of a small shoot channel over here. And pay attention to what happens in this band. It goes from expansional uh, like if it replays strongly expansional and after the cutoff, cut it goes strongly uh, uh, translational and counterpoint bar development is, goes with that. So the blue colors are where the bar type index uh, is low. The same thing in, in um, this example, if you pay attention to this uh, large band over here, typical neck cutoff uh, and lots of translation uh, downstream translation and counterpoint bar development along that. In general, quite a bit of blue in these maps, regardless of whether the bands are close to the uh, resistant boundary or not. Okay, let's uh, uh, talk about incision a little bit. Uh, here is a, a 3D model that uh, we have built. Uh, if the reference for this, if you're interested, is Twitter 2019. Uh, the point of this is only that uh, by um, simple autogenic meandering processes coupled with uh, uh, incision result in all these terraces on the, on the left side in this case. Uh, and that's purely autogenic, right? Uh, and we can uh, see similar features in, in modern rivers, uh, all these terraces. Uh, this is on the Trinity River, uh, Texas, and quite a bit of work has been done on these. Uh, one thing we need to keep in mind, and this has been pointed out before, um, is that if you look at the cross section of a, a model from such a river, uh, we might find something like this. Let's, let's say you go out and take some samples and do some uh, fancy age dating, and you find that this is 2000 years old, this is a lot older, and this is even a lot older. So it's gonna be very tempting to say a story about how things changed between this and this and this and this, and there's a lot of missing uh, deposition, uh, something happened to the river, that kind of uh, thinking. Well, if I show the Wheeler diagram for this, where erosion is red and deposition is blue, you can see that uh, there's a com complicated history behind this. And the reason you see those gaps in time is that everything that I blend out now, you know, going from this to this has been eroded away. So preservation is low in these systems and these terraces can form autogenetically. In, in, in fact, they form all the time. So our primary uh, hypothesis should be that they are autogenic and only later can uh, we work to move that out. Okay. The third subject, uh, this is about submarine channels and degradation primarily. And we are, uh, our group has been studying this system in the Gulf of Mexico, the Eastern side of the Gulf of Mexico. This is the Florida escarpment. Beautiful system, beautiful seismic data. Uh, Jake Kovold has been uh, working a lot with this data. Uh, and if you look at the section along the channel, we see that this is a strongly aggradational unheard of uh, something like this in, in fluvial systems, of course. And you see these J shapes, the downstream is left to right, and these J shapes that are predominantly going in the downstream direction. Uh, and uh, if we look at the system through time, uh, this is a horizon from the base, low sinuosity, higher sinuosity in the middle, uh, and then, um, and then really high sinuosity at the very top. Uh, and one of uh, the students uh, in our group, uh, uh, Paul Morris, who is doing his PhD, 
uh, on this system uh, has spent a lot of time mapping the channels and adding the center lines. And that's how it looks like going from purple, uh, the old uh, and yellow, uh, young. Uh, and for, for a long time, we have been saying, uh, some of us have been saying anyway, that um, plan U migration patterns are pretty similar qualitatively in rivers uh, and in, uh, in submarine channels. And this is an example carefully cherry picked from the Bang Off. And, and if you compare the patterns in the two images, I think it's, it's amazing how similar they are. Now we can say that we have some data on this. And this is some work that Indre Altman, uh, a master student, uh, did uh, on the Joshua channel. So she took some of those center lines and did the, the work that we did on rivers in the Amazon basin and found that, yes, there is a correlation between migration distance and curvature. Uh, so at least in this system, but I think we will find that this holds to elsewhere as well, uh, river uh, submarine channels behave in the plan view anyway, behave quite similarly to submarine channels. Uh, finally, uh, let's think about aggradation uh, in general, uh, more specifically in submarine channels. Here is a plot that Paul has generated of sinuosity uh, shown in red uh, and degradation shown in, uh, this is basically elevation through time uh, shown in blue. Uh, on the y-axis we have, on the x-axis, sorry, we have uh, uh, a proxy for time, right? And it is obvious that both of these sinuosity and uh, elevation degradation increase through time. So they are strongly correlated. Maybe there is a causation between the two. And that's where this simple model of auto degradation came from. Uh, so this is work in progress, but I think it's an interesting idea where we say the initial center line tends to be low sinuosity. And when we go to uh, a much higher sinuosity channel, then by geometric necessity, the slope has to decrease through time. And that's what you see here. Okay. Uh, uh, that's, that's pretty obvious, but Things get interesting if we say, let's combine, let's say that deposition and erosion are a function of slope. Uh, you know, that's, that's is basically a, a, a simple uh, stream power low type relationship. And we say that there's a bypass slope for which there is no erosion, no deposition. Above it, uh, we have incision. And that slope values that are lower, we have deposition. So if we run this model for, forward, uh, we get this kind of elevation curve, incision initially. And once you cross the bypass slope uh, along the channel, then you go into uh, aggradation. Exactly that J shape that we uh, uh, saw in Joshua channel and many other channels. So here is a, a visualization of that uh, showing a little bit of incision initially. Uh, and then significant degradation. So this is the same system that I showed the plots for in the previous slides. Uh, and again, this is all happening, happening autogenically. There is no need to change the sea level. Uh, nothing external needs to happen. The only, only thing you need is initially low sinuosity channel developing high sinuosity through time, and you need enough sediment, of course, to, uh, to, to make this happen, right? Uh, both in rivers and submarine channels, if there's not enough sediment, then meandering, especially in the aggradational mode, is going to be a problem. So to wrap it up, um, Simple models, I think, explain many aspects of meandering, and we shouldn't be afraid of, uh, you know, uh, digging deeper into some of these simple models. Actually, don't need a whole lot of mathematical background. Uh, migration rates are more predictable if the curvature migration uh, lag is considered, and we should do this point by point, not averaging across bands. The bar type index is a way to quantify the point bar and counterpoint bar spectrum, and uh, it should help us to uh, predict uh, better heterogeneities in, in meandering fluvial systems. Submarine channels show a curvature migration relationship that is similar to reverse. Uh, well, at least one of them does. Uh, and finally, aggradation of submarine channels might be related to uh, an increase in sinuosity. 
uh, and that would be an autogenic explanation to a relatively enigmatic uh, phenomenon. Uh, and I'd like to thank our sponsors and uh, I'm uh, also grateful for all these uh, open, open source uh, software tools that uh, we have access to. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much indeed, Zoltan. Uh, excellent presentation. Great way to end the day. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, I have a question for you from, um, from John Mode. Do we see this upward component to migrating point bars in outcrop, uh, stepping across and upwards? The, which components, I'm sorry? The, do we see this upward component to migrating point bars in outcrop? Stepping across okay. and upwards. I think he's talking about the J, the J signature oh, he's describing. The the J shape, yeah. Hmm. Well, in so fluvial systems uh, uh, grade a lot less, uh, um, basically at least an order of magnitude, if I remember well, uh, less than submarine channels. So uh, it would be uh, in the first place. It's hard to to uh, I, I think it's hard to quantify a gradation in outcrop it's not impossible but it's hard in fluvial systems mm. uh, which means that so so often you are looking at you know thin slivers of preserved uh, sediment from the previous story if you wish um, uh, and and so you would have to put together this you know you have you would have to measure aggradation rate at very high resolution to be able to detect this j shape but I, I don't think it's impossible, but it, it's not going to be easy. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, another question from from Chris Jackson. Um, I won't read the first part. Um, question is: Are there any described kinematics? Any of the described kinematics sensitive to changes in slope and or sediment grain size? Um, that's a tough question. Um, hmm. Translation: I don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> you can come back yeah, to it. So, so <laughs> I, I think, I mean, uh, so far the work we did, I, I think it, it seems like these relationships work well in, in um, classic meandering systems, which have quite a bit of fine grain sediment, and mm. the, you know. Maybe it, it, it could be, if, I mean, there are gravel bed meandering rivers as well, and I think it should work there too. Um, but it definitely big, breaks down if you try, you know, if, if there are cities along the river and humans are messing with them, then, then uh, this is, is not going to work. Or also the, the sediment discharge actually, actually that uh, we just, uh, uh, I worked with uh, uh, Michelle Donovan and Patrick, Patrick Bellman uh, um, on uh, some systems uh, in Minnesota where uh, if you take away the sediment, uh, the meandering uh, basically doesn't happen as it should. So the, the mm. meanders kind of stop evolving uh, and this relationship goes away entirely. And mm. there's a river where in one stretch you have lots of sediment and then, and then you don't. And the stretch where there's lots of sediment, this relationship works beautifully, and then it just doesn't. Uh, where there's yeah. no no bed load. That's what I mean by by no sediment. Um, we are running massively over to, uh, 15 minutes over time. Um, I've got another question here from from Anna. Um, she said, "Great talk. Uh, you mentioned methods for predicting counter counterpoint bars." Can we apply this on seismic data and what are the challenges that you would expect? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think the answer is uh, uh, positive. Uh, as, as long as you can reconstruct uh, at least some details of the channel evolution, uh, mm. you should be able to uh, calculate the bar type index uh, and basically make an image like the one uh, you can see on the screen. Um, yeah. uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Paul Durkin uh, and others uh, and Steve Hubbard's group have been 
have been working towards uh, something like that uh, and and there should be more coming uh, from there okay great I, I think we should probably try and wrap it up uh, now um if if anyone else has any further questions then i'd encourage them to take uh, contact with zoltan directly again thank you very much to uh, to our north north american uh, guests today it's a great end to the day thanks very much